Um, is God and man still relevant? Um, how could it be more so? Uh, so many of the things that, that we read about here, these, the instances of, of uh, uh, you know, intellectual irresponsibility and, um, for lack of a better term, sort of moral latitudinarianism, uh, are, if anything, bigger now uh, than they were then. And, you know, you can't go to a campus these days without having uh, some wild left-winger uh, acting badly in public and then wrapping himself in the mantle of quote-unquote academic freedom to uh, justify it. So you probably some of you in this room will remember the uh, case of Ward Churchill, who uh, in the aftermath of 9-11 wrote an article um, about how the real villains, the real villains of 9-11 were the people who worked in the World Trade Tower because they were like Adolf Eichmann, uh, just making sure the trains ran on time to their ill-salubrious destination. Well, when, when uh, you know, this of course is the kind of thing that college campuses love, you know, I mean, like, here's a guy who's, I mean, really anti-American, we thought, you know, at least we could sort of, uh, you know, we rally around the United States when it comes to, you know, people plowing uh, jetliners into, into uh, skyscrapers, but no, Ward Churchill thought that the people who worked in the trade towers were the real villains. And when he went around uh, the, the, the country to speak at, at campuses, and he was very popular for a while, uh, it was always under the rubric of academic freedom and free speech, they said. Well, note the, uh, note the sort of elision there. Academic freedom is not a blanket uh, right. It is a privilege accorded to people who are engaged in a certain activity, namely the pursuit of truth. That's what academic freedom means. Academic freedom means you are free to pursue the truth. Freedom of speech is something quite different, something very valuable. I'm glad that uh, people can, uh, you know, make fools of themselves in Zuccotti Square and so on. I wish they'd, uh, you know, their, their um, personal hygiene leaves something to be desired and indeed their, their behavior in other ways. But, um, you know, it, it's really, it's quite, you know, it's, a, it's marvelous that, that people can do that. It's like, you know, Speaker's Corner in London. You can get up on a soapbox and say whatever silly thing you want. But that's not academic freedom. But these two things have been kind of blurred together on many college campuses today. And I think there's something, uh, uh, he, although he didn't, didn't talk about free speech in quite the same way, there's something about that that is at the core of God and man at Yale. Bill um, uh, was, there, there, there's a, a, a biblical uh, tag I always like to, uh, I always think of, when I think of Bill Buckley, I, th I think of the book of Genesis and the line that says, God made the world and saw it was good. And I think that that really is right at the core of what Bill Buckley was. Here's somebody who delighted in the panoply of the world, whether it was uh, uh, racing or wine or the music of Bach uh, or, or helping young people or, uh, uh, whatever. But what does that kind of delight and relish depend upon? One of the things it depends upon is freedom, and freedom uh, especially to freedom against this kind of deadening homogeneity uh, that you see, in, uh, you see in an institution devoted to diversity that is r ruled by political correctness, I mean, who would have thought that an institution devoted to higher education, to the liberal arts, or the arts that are supposed to free us, that's why they're called liberal, would uh, at the same time uh, absorb this toxin of, of political correctness, which is kind of the enforcer uh, of this ideology of diversity. And um, that's certainly one of the lessons I took away uh, from this book. Uh, and just one other thing. Um, uh, and toward the end of the book, Bill refers to a, a Supreme Court decision, so far as I know, not, never overturned, uh, Pierce versus the uh, Society of Sisters. And the Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, uh, said that teachers shall be of good moral character and patriotic disposition, and that certain studies plainly essential to good citizenship be taught, and that nothing be taught which is manifestly inimical to public welfare. Now, can you imagine any university having the temerity to put that on its mission statement today? 
I mean, it's quite amazing. Well, I think the fact that, uh, that um, uh, you can't imagine any elite university doing that shows um, not only how far we have uh, fallen, but also the continuing relevance for this very eloquent book. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> Bob uh, Tyrrell. <clears throat> well, um, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to uh, address a que question that was raised uh, earlier, I think, by Bruce Gelb over um, the question of uh, you're to be young when you're liberal and conservative when you're old. I think, by the way, Churchill was one of the first people to raise that uh, formulation. And I, I put it a little differently. <clears throat> when I was young, I was conservative. And as I got older, I became very, very conservative. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I look forward to a full life of becoming really and truly conservative <laughs> because it makes the liberals crazy. And uh, that's kind of a lazy way of saying it because they were born crazy. <clears throat> But um, I gave, gave a little thought to, um, to Bill and to um, his book, and uh, to several of his books, actually. And um, I thought about many times when I was with Bill, um, time and time, the lectures, the uh, public addresses, and things like that, you all know about things like that. But you don't know about the um, one aspect of his life that I found r I ran into with him all the time. I remember once we were crossing uh, Park Avenue, and uh, I was looking <coughs> over at Bill, and Bill had a, a, a mound of uh, manuscript uh, held up to his chest, a and he had something in his hand, a pen, a red, red ink pen probably, and his glasses perched on his eyes, and, and I thought to myself, he's not going to get 10 paces across Park Avenue, but this whole thing is going to cascade down to the ground. And sure enough, it did. Papers every place, the red pen, his glasses. And people came from all over to help him scurry around and pick up his papers, because Bill was, <coughs> even in Manhattan, one of the most <coughs> famous men in America one of the most famous minds in America. Um, he was as famous as Henry Kissinger, uh, who hasn't been replaced. Uh, and many people like Bill uh, from that era haven't been replaced. Um, there is a, 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 a judge from Chicago, you perhaps know him, he's a kind of an idiot by the name of Posner. He's a, he's a moral idiot at any rate, <coughs> grant me that. I think he's probably an idiot. He's excellent at crossword puzzles or something, but he's... <clears throat> but at any rate, um, Posner wrote a, a, an essay some years ago about the lamenting the loss of the public intellectual from the square. Um, I'd ask the learned judge, where the hell that public intellectual would perform today, because and who would listen to him, or her? Um, there's not such a creature because there's well, as Burkhardt said, there's a time and place for things, and things reach their fullness at, in a time. And uh, frankly, we've kind of passed the time today for public intellectuals. Um, that was Bill's time. And I, would, I guess I'd also say that I, I got, to, got to thinking about this, and I thought, what's re necessary for a public intellectual? I hate the term. Let's just say an intellectual. Uh, and I think maybe the first celebrated intellectual uh, in the 20th century, and that's about the time that, that it was ripe for this kind of intellectual, was H.L. Mencken. And he was ripe because, A, he was very thoughtful and very <coughs> luminous and very witty. Uh, but also, there was in place a mass, mass media to broadcast his words to lesser people. Heretofore, heretofore he'd have um, 
he'd have to talk <coughs> out through his um, publication, whatever it might be, or through letters and to, to people uh, like Montaigne and people like that. <clears throat> but now he had he could be a part of of of, of mass media, and he could kind of. Um, uh, cross fertilize, so to speak, with Hollywood. Um, there was a lot of that in those days, um, and, and uh, he, it was a time was right for him, and uh, the time was right for Bill, and Bill was a terrifically famous and versatile intellectual. But how this kind of brings us back to God and Man at Yale is that Mencken was a very famous atheist. And I think now we see that, May, that Mencken triumphed. Uh, the book is not at all relevant to any university I've ever been at, because the universities have gone so far toward modernity uh, that it's hard to imagine them, them to come back. On the other hand, uh, another way of putting it is the university is so irrelevant to our lives. Uh, we heard a speaker earlier speak about how um, <coughs> uh, you go to the university, oh, <laughs> Professor Gatiss, a, a person, you go to the university for four years and most of them leave and believe exactly what they came in thinking. Uh, and I think that's probably pretty true. I, the university's never changed my mind and I've never been on one on a university campus in which I was ever in the ascendancy. But, so I think the universities um, have kind of lost. But where Bill triumphed was in society, was in America, uh, was in sophisticated realms of American life and of, world, of the world life. I mean, Bill's views uh, weren't original, but his views on um, economics are now held, whether the people admit it or not, throughout around the world. Uh, Bill's views on foreign policy are held around the world. Uh, Bill's views in general are the views of adult America. Liberalism today is dead. You'll find out in 2012, if you don't know now, liberalism is dead. Conservatism is in the ascendancy. It was in the ascendancy in 2008 when we outnumbered the uh, liberals uh, 40, 40 to 20%, 40% 40 to 20%. And uh, now we've got the independents and the moderates on our side. So I think uh, in a odd and funny way, uh, men can won the, camp the, the, uh, the uh, competition for men's souls. But Bill won the competition for his point of view for conservatism, and I thank uh, I thank Bill Buckley for that, and I thank you all for being here. Thank you, Bob.